Welcome to the Tradies in Business podcast with your hosts, Warwick Bidwell and Nicole Cox. Divert your phone and grab a brew as Waz and Nick unpack tips, tales, secrets and stuff-ups from guests both inside and outside your trade, helping educate and inspire you to break the cycle of gut-busting and money stress and create a true trade business. Okay, we're recording. So the spinning wheel of death has ended and we are now back online. <laughs> it is such a typical Was and Nick way to start a podcast episode. Coxie, how are you this morning? I'm well. It'd be boring if we did anything but that, really. <laughs> I'm still laughing on the inside, Coxie, about a webinar we did not so long ago where <laughs> we were in the wrong Zoom room and as we entered the correct one, didn't realize that we had like 25 people already there waiting and one of us may have let an expletive go about that would be me (laughs) there might have been several of them in a string actually at least you own it and somebody actually typed in the chat box and said we can see and hear you (laughs) (laughs) vanessa lambert from hazard co welcome to the podcast Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. But be kind, I'm a podcast virgin. So uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I do okay. You'll be fine. But you'll be better than us, that's uh, that's for sure. <laughs> so listeners, we are joined by Vanessa from Hazard Co. Um, Hazard Co. were recent supporters of the Tradies and Business Excellence Awards. So, um, And we've been having some great chats with yourself about safety and uh, we're looking forward to doing some more stuff with you guys around that. Um, I guess talking safety is, it's almost been, oh, this is going to be an awful pun that I do not intend, but it's been done to death. <laughs> there you go. You knew that was coming. Sorry. That's this shocking, is. Worry. Uh, I'm sure you get up at like 4am and write down all the terrible puns you could make. In I, don't, I don't even have to try, Coxie. They're just bad <laughs> straight out of the gate. <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> so it has been talked about a heck of a lot. And I, I feel like sometimes small business owners are probably sick of hearing about it and that can lead to a bit of apathy. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what do you guys see out there in the marketplace, Vanessa, as far as attitudes to safety? Yeah, look, they're, they are they do vary. So obviously we um, we deal only in the construction industry, so um, I can only speak for the guys in construction, but um, we do work with lots of different trades um, and also uh, builders who are managing lots of different trades. So I guess the attitudes differ depending on which side of that spectrum they sit. Um, but, you know, I also own a trade business, so um, I can give you my exact point of view from working with my husband, who's been a Sparky for over 25 years. Um, and it's definitely been a journey. I think initially your, um, you know, the the blokey attitude and the, and the she'll be right, um, you know, I'm invincible type um, is quite, is quite normal. It's like, oh, it won't happen to me. I'm only going to do it this once. Um, it's, it's not a big deal. You know, you're making a big deal of nothing kind of thing. And then it's unfortunate that it usually does take something happening, um, before the realization hits, um, that actually, um, this is serious. Like I, I can actually hurt myself, um, to the point where I may not wake, wake up in the morning, which is obviously not what we want. So, Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's really um, I wish it I wish it was better I wish I wish it wasn't so hard and I think a lot of the times you know the things in place so paperwork and so forth don't necessarily mean that you're going to be safe at the top of the ladder mm-hmm. and so that's essentially where Hazardco came in so we were created by a builder and a tradie and um, they were just so confused and sick of all the OH&S legislation that they didn't understand. They wanted to simplify it um, and make a process that was easy to follow. And so there was kind of no excuse not to do it. Um, And eventually what that ended up as is a digital solution, which what it is today, that reduces risk on site and, um, you know, improves people's 
experience of safety. So making it more of a, a team conversation. Like anything, and I know that you guys are big on mental health, um, it just comes down to communication. It's mm. it's really actually very simple. If we keep the conversation open and honest, um, then the likelihood is we're going to have less um, incidents on site. I think it needs to be a conversation. When I think about, so as a builder, we did our safety stuff many moons ago. Now I think about seven or eight years ago. It was the most complex, difficult, challenging rubbish I'd ever put in place and none of it made anybody safe. It was just sign here, do this, do that, but nobody was any safer. It didn't reduce any risk. Uh, And it almost made people more complacent because they felt like they had a safety net of safety that wasn't actually there because it still takes the people on the ground, whoever's there, to actually assess the risk in the moment and ensure that they're doing everything possible to keep themselves safe and those around them safe. And it's the it's probably the exposure to the things you think can't happen. Um, you know, even with 25, 30 years of experience, yep. the strangest things can happen on site. And if you haven't followed due process, suddenly you're in an all in all sorts of trouble. And I think that having the the paperwork, the old way of doing things just increases the complacency and people actually aren't taking the time to consider what's in front of them on a day-to-day basis. A hundred percent. And you're not the only person to say that. In fact, pretty much every conversation that we have with the builder starts with, oh yeah, I have a folder somewhere. Mm. Where is it? In the office, in the U, in the portal on site. Oh yeah, does anyone actually do anything with it? No. But but I have a folder. And it's like, okay. <laughs> well that's, that's better than nothing, I guess. Um, but but essentially, yeah creating something that's digital that can be used on the ground in real time mm. where you can actually assess um, what's happening and then note it and record it mm. um, is is as easy as it as it's gonna get um, and I think there's a lot there's a lot of attitudes that go with it I mean it, essentially there's never going to be a solution that you know fixes all all problems or reduces all risk on site there's still mm. you still need to have you know, some common sense um, mm-hmm. and you still need to have conversations um, and you still need to speak up because, unfortunately, uh, we haven't quite got rid of the stigma of, you know, just do it, you know. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and it's and we've been we've been in those scenarios and um, I'll put my hand up and say, yeah, we, we have done some stupid things in our mm-hmm. time. But we've just gone, oh, yeah, he's told us to do it better, just get it done. Yeah. Um, but over the years, and I guess, you know, having a family and definitely having an experience ourselves where, mm. you know, I'd be ended up in hospital for five days, um, was an eye-opener where mm. you're like, hang on a minute, I've got a duty of care to the people that work for mm. me. I've mm. got a duty of care to my family. I've got a duty of care to myself. Mm. So I'm just going to stand up and say, no, I'm not yeah. doing it. It's not safe. And I'll come back when it is. Um, and you get laughed at, you get name calls. It's pretty horrible, um, but essentially we just need to get better at doing it because you can't fix it after you've made the mistake. That's the, the the big problem. You mentioned common sense, and I think other than the, the tradie memes or the people in the tradie memes that we see out there, most tradies are really practical with their common sense, right? But they tend to get caught up in that culture that you're talking about. There still is too much of that culture within the construction industry. She'll be right. Oh, don't be a sissy. Pull your socks up. Pull your skirt up. You'll be okay. Just do the job. Do as you're asked. And that's rubbish. We need to start calling that out. And we need to do it loudly so that there is the push for change because it's it's incredible to me to see just even in my own community, um, I've referenced this before on the podcast, uh, maybe 18 months ago now, I walked out the front and somebody's re-roofing a house without any edge protection. How do you even get to that point? And that stuff is still happening. Like there were five guys on the roof. Why doesn't any of them stand up and say, this isn't acceptable? I want edge protection. We have to. It's legal. Um, but that stuff isn't happening because we're not calling it out enough yet. Yeah. And I think there's um, there's also a, not much education around it. Um, so we know that it's legal, that you've mm. got to have it. But a lot of a lot of the guys doing the work have not had any training within their apprenticeships, um, and it's kind of like I don't know. This is just the way I've always done it, so mm-hmm. I, I don't mm-hmm. realise is I'm meant to be doing it any other way. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there does need to be a little bit more um, of an education process as well as you know uh, an attitude adjustment. 
Absolutely. You used a word before, Vanessa, of attitude. <clears throat> and I feel like um, there's a disconnect between the the legislation and the legislative requirements, the paperwork, even if it is digital, and the attitude to quote unquote safety. It's almost like people just become complacent as well because it hasn't happened on their building side or they've never had anything happen to them or nothing serious anyway. Mm. And it's the same way people drive their cars. They get complacent because they haven't been in an accident or they haven't lost a loved one. Uh, And their attitude is one of not consciously for most people, I think, but the attitude is that it'll never happen to me scenario. Mm. And it requires a level of vigilance, I think, around behaviors. And, you know, I'm, I'm a, a passionate home handyman and uh, I use power tools and chainsaws and all that sort of stuff. And for me, because I don't do it all the time as my, as my form of employment, I actually stick to what I know to be safety practices uh, because, you know, common sense is not that common in the world. Uh, you know, I'm using a chainsaw and I wear all the gear all the time. I was the same as a motorcycle rider, uh, all the gear all the time. And I recall having a chat with a client a few years ago who actually cut himself with an angle grinder on a site. And luckily it was just, it was only luck that he didn't actually remove an entire thumb. um, And he wasn't wearing gloves. And I said, now now I'm a business coach. I'm not a safety guy, but I said to him, (laughs) do you think gloves might have been a good idea using an angle grinder dude? He's like, no, they're dangerous, man. You can't hold the grinder properly. I'm like, okay, I'm not even going to have this conversation with you right now. If you'd been wearing gloves, you wouldn't have chopped a hole in your hand. Like, They're not yeah. comfortable or something, but this is the attitude thing. I mean, how the heck do you shift that with mm. compliance? It's um, baby steps and actually two, two very different things. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to say that compliance doesn't always necessarily mean you're going to do everything right. And that might sound that might sound odd, mm. um, but there are lots of people who are qualified safety advisors who still argue the fact on certain compliance documents because they don't necessarily change what you're doing. Just because you have a piece of paper doesn't mean you're actually going to act on what it says. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing as a as a whole, as um you know, from a legislative point of view, it is something that I think needs to be reconsidered and reworked and look there is definitely conversations happening which is awesome and it's and it's a work in progress um and I think that's what kind of makes our solution a little bit different is that we change the language it's still compliant but it's it's making it simple it's not over complicating things no one reads legislation and goes oh yeah I completely understand who's <laughs> responsible for that is I mean, you know, there's numbers and codes and, you know, I don't know, is is that my responsibility or is that someone Mm. else's? It's very hard to decipher. Mm. So it's really we sort of pick out the main ones and say this is this is sort of your your absolute minimum standard of of compliance and then here is what you should be doing on an ongoing basis, so active safety management. And that's really that's outside of compliance but really the part that's going to make a difference to you, your business and all your all your workers because it becomes fairly evident when you start doing active safety management what things you're doing well and what things not so well. Um, and a lot of guys are actually afraid to admit it. They're like, oh, no, I don't want to, I don't want to write that down. I don't, to, I don't want to record that, you know, we didn't test and tag or yeah. that somebody had a ladder that wasn't a scratch. And I'm like, but you, but you have to because that's, part of the process that's you learning that hang on we've got to put some better processes in place or got to have a toolbox tool can get everyone to test and tag whatever it might be you're not going to do it unless you've put a cross against it and said mm. we didn't get that right on that one occasion and that's okay like, we're not going to get it right every time but we need to get in a, in a process where we can sit down just like anything else you know, when you run a business, for you guys, you know, being business coaches, I'm sure that you tell your clients that they should have a 90-day plan and at, at the end of the 90 days they should review it and, you know, you don't stick to the same 90-day plan forever. It's going to change and evolve as mm-hmm. your business changes and evolves. Well, safety is no different. You've constantly got different people working on your job site. 
you're never going to have the same issues always reoccurring. But if you do have the same issues always reoccurring, that's also a red flag. Hey, we're not doing anything about it. We're just, we know that it's there and it's that's it. And I don't, don't know how to fix it kind of thing. Um, mm. So having having those simple processes, and, and it's literally five minutes, you know, five minutes on a job site that could possibly change the whole direction um, of how your team performs um, and could eventually save someone's life. So. Mm. That's the end goal, obviously. We want everyone to go home safely. It sometimes seems as though <clears throat> that's almost the only considered risk of not having the safety in place is a death, which is which is catastrophic for so many reasons. And yet, you know, in terms of statistics, and they can be horrendous at times, uh, I feel like the bigger risk to business owners and to those of you listening to this podcast are the seemingly smaller incidents mm. because of the disruption to business, the increase in work cover premiums, the just the the stress and the distraction of dealing with an incident, sometimes serious, but you know, th- there's there's thousands of incidents every day, unfortunately. And, you know, we get to hear about some of them here from our clients, sometimes with panicked messages like, oh my gosh, this has just happened to one of my team members. What the hell do I do now? And, and I think there needs to be a better understanding from employers, particularly in, in small to medium business, that it's about actually managing those, you know, less catastrophic events, because they can actually have a catastrophic effect on your business. 100%. Yes, yeah, totally is that agree. What you see, Vanessa? Yeah, absolutely. So we obviously have um, incident reporting as part of the app. So we um, we do get flagged when an incident happens on one of our members' sites. Um, and then usually we'll follow up with a, a phone call and check that they're okay. You know, varying, varying, um, I guess, like varying scale of, mm. of severity um, from near misses when literally nothing has really happened but they're just as important to mm. to report because the next time mm. it could, could result in something that's very different yep. um, to, you know, a cut finger that requires a little bit of first aid and, and a Band-Aid to, you know, a hospital visit to mm. falling off roofs. Um, so, you know, m- massive, massive sort of shift. But in each case you're 100% right there is always going to be a disruption and then there is stress. That comes. Mm. Even with the most, you know, the smallest one, uh, you know, are they going to report me? Have I done something that yeah. I shouldn't have been doing? Um, I know it hasn't resulted in anything right now, but are they going to come back at me in three, six months? Mm. What paperwork was I meant to file? Am I meant to tell someone, do I call work safe? Do I call work cover? Do I pretend it never happened and, and pray <laughs> for the best. Like there's, you know, there's so many things going through your head. And I, we've had it happen in our own business and it is scary and, it, and it's frightening and you think, oh, my God, you know, what, what happens now? Am I going to get investigated? Is someone going to come out and, you know, mm-hmm. give me a slap? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know because I've never been. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're, I guess, um, lucky that for, for our members we we do provide you know advisory support in, the, in those instances and so we can step them through the process um and, and just hold their hand and say you know it's okay we'll, we'll work through it but it is it is a learning experience um mm-hmm. and and often unfortunately it does take that learning experience for them to sort of re-evaluate their current um processes but in most cases um the good news is that they have been doing active safety management. So if it was big enough for someone to come out and investigate, they've got a whole heap of, you know, reporting to, to say, look, we were managing the job really well. This is what happened on this day, this day and this day. It's unfortunate that in this particular instance, human error has prevailed mm-hmm. um, and we have still ended up with an incident. Um, but that can be the difference between not a worry, you know, great work on, on active safety management let's, you know, close this and move on with our lives and a massive, you know, infringement or improvement notice. So mm. that's the scale of, of difference. Um, do nothing, probably going to result in a much heftier um, penalty. Doing something, um, caring, 
can you know result in less of a penalty and more of a this is this is how you should be doing it let's move towards you know a better process Having been on the receiving end of a few inspectors on site on multiple occasions, thanks, team, um, <laughs> I can assure you that having that support is invaluable. Having someone who understands the process, who's been there before, can pat you on the back and say, actually, it's okay. You've done absolutely everything you can to balance the risk here. This one's on the individual, which fortunately for me each time for us was um, they had nothing to do with us personally, but, of course, they're our team. So, and it's our site, so as the principal contractor, we carry the balance of risk. Uh, so we have to go through that process, and it's really stressful. It's very arduous. There's a lot of paperwork that needs to be provided, and to have someone or a system in place that makes it simple, it's it's your insurance policy. It's yeah. making sure that you as the business owner have done everything you can to keep your team safe. Yes, they're still going to make mistakes or strange things can happen. We had a site where it wasn't even... Um, it was external to us. However, it crashed into our guy's ute. So a, a water truck had oh. paused or pulled up on a hill and was pumping water in for a swimming pool and his brakes let go. Came straight down the hill, very high, steep hill, straight into our guy's ute, ruined his ute. He had literally just stepped back when he heard the noise and a shout, looked up. So he was the luckiest guy ever. Um, so again, that that was not our fault. Had absolutely nothing to do with our active site, and yet we get part. We suddenly are part of this investigation because it impacted one of our team members' vehicles, and very easily could have impacted him as well. So it, just having someone there, almost to hold your hand through the process, to reassure you, to help you understand or gather what you need to gather to ensure that you've got everything in place. Um, totally changes the conversation. And I can promise you when the investigators do turn up and they can see that you have demonstrated um, ability to have been actively working on your safety plan, their conversation changes too. They're not looking for the faults anymore. They're suddenly looking for how can we help you get through this process? Mm-hmm. So just yeah. that there's been support. a massive shift. I mean, each state is slightly different. Obviously, we've got, you know, our, the, the overreaching Safe Work Australia and then each state and territory has their own individual, um, you know, state legislative body. But there has been um, a, a massive shift in the way that each state body um, works and functions. I think that whole, you know, um, authority type attitude, you know, power tripping type um, mm-hmm. health and safety inspector is a thing of the past. Um, it doesn't work. Um, it just pisses people off and, and, it, and essentially creates even more stigma that um, I don't care either way. I'm just, I'm still not going to do it because you just annoyed me. Um, and uh, frankly, you're an a-hole is, is pretty much you know, <laughs> what you're going to get from, from the building site. So it, it's really awesome that over, I'd say probably the last five years particularly, but even, even the last 10, uh, there's been a massive shift in the way they campaign. There's been a massive shift in the way they audit um, in their their personas on site, um, and and it is more around you know at the end of the day we are trying to help. It's not we're not here to um, to make life more difficult, but it is you are the principal contractor and and it is your responsibility. So you have to be able to prove that you're doing everything you possibly can. Unfortunately for uh, for builders and and for some of our members, that can be quite tricky, mm. um, particularly at the moment because you know there is a big trade shortage, so you, you don't have a huge selection of of trades that you can pick and choose from. Mm. And so when you get you know a couple of guys who are doing things they probably shouldn't be doing, it becomes really hard to tackle. Because in an ideal world, you'd love to tell them, "Get off my site." Yeah. And I'll find someone else to do it. Um, but at the moment, that's really hard because that could that goes back to what you were saying um, was around you know that delays my job site, that delays my cash flow. Yep. Um, so it, it's how do, how do we how do we balance this? How do we create some something that's simple and easy to use that people aren't going to be too um, standoffish on? That still ticks the boxes that we can still continue working and um, doesn't sort of disrupt our ability to function. At the end of the day, you know, a builder's licence can be revoked um, pretty easily if someone on their site is doing something stupid. And it's unfortunate, but that's the way 
that's the way the system's designed um, and it's, it's, it's tough to handle. If we can get everybody on the same page, that's that's the yeah. that's I guess the whole the whole point is it doesn't matter if you're a one man van or a principal contractor or a building site, we should all be doing whatever we can to mm-hmm. keep ourselves safe and keep everyone else around us um, in check. I think that's a an important point to make as well. We talk a lot about builders and primary contractors, uh, and I was going to say government needs to make someone ultimately responsible. That's the way our society is set up, whether you agree with it or not. <clears throat> We're all about, you know, fixing responsibility and liability to a party or a company or somebody at the end of the day. Uh, and for the sub trades, you know, electricians, plumbers, landscapers, uh, any of the other trades working either with builders or on their own, um, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, it's looking at it as a team approach. You know, if I'm a plumber on a builder's job and I do something dumb and cause an issue, that affects the builder as much as it does me, but it flows back to me, no pun intended. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, I just can't, I can't help it. It's just a skill. But uh, that flows back to me because, you know, the builder's site gets shut Mm. down for a period of time or, you you know, it delays the job and that's going to affect me as the sub trade anyway. So I think there's sometimes a bit of shirking of that responsibility. It's like, well, you know, we don't have to worry about it because it's the builder's site. But the problem is we're all contributing to how well that works or doesn't work uh, as part of just anybody being involved in any of those projects. And I guess more than that, it's just, I don't personally understand the blase nature of of some employers um, and employees, to be honest, about risk. You know, it, it's 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 a weird paradox for me to watch this happen because as a society we appear to be so risk averse these days. We're so afraid of um, risk in so many areas. And, you know, we're, we're removing risk from so many places in our lives and yet you go to building sites or, you know, lunatics like me using a chainsaw on the weekend and we just get really sloppy and the risks are huge for that yep. stuff. So anyway, I haven't asked you a question, Vanessa. I've just lamented <laughs> a whole bunch of human behavioral stuff. I did no, have a question. I, I actually agree. It's a good point. Like we, as a society, I mean, you know, and I think that's come from, the, you know, the legal ramifications of so much now, like you can't mm. sort of put one foot in front of the other without someone trying to sue you. So there's there's all these, you know, uh, e- even in the school ground, you know, you know yeah. no more monkey bars or or flying foxes or whatever it is because someone might come back at us for their kid breaking their arm, which obviously, you know, was was pretty normal 20 years ago. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting and it's a really good point. Um, that in general life where we're sort of, you know, bubble wrapping everyone and then mm. you get on a job site and it's just like um, it's like a party. I'm free. Mm. I'll just do whatever <laughs> I want. <laughs> like it's like, no, it's not meant to work that way. This should be kind of, you know, at least level playing field or the opposite. Let's let's mm. switch it up <laughs> and, um, and kind of take on a little bit more of a um, safety attitude. Mm. On mm. Coxie, I'm... I just drew breath at the same time, so I'm <laughs> going to let Nick go. <laughs> we do this all the time. I'm really keen to explore something you said earlier, Vanessa, about using um, common language. So a big part for us when we were trying to implement our safety plan in the first place was doing things like having our safety data sheets. And the guys would be like, well, what do I even need to know this for? And honestly, in the beginning, it was well, I gave them the spiel that the legal paperwork said why we needed to have it. But when we took that conversation back and said, look, it's like this. If you put silicon onto the apprentice's sandwich and he's got to go to hospital, the ambulance driver needs to know what he's just eaten. It's as simple as that. And when yeah. you take it back to those simple terms, then the people on site can actually attach their values to those simple terms and it becomes something that's easy to implement. So I'm really keen to hear how you or well, the company has translated that legal jargon that makes no sense to anyone into <laughs> terms that we can all understand. Yeah. So some things we can't change, like the names of things. So, um, you know, like the site-specific safety plans in each state have certain names and obviously we have to represent the same 
names, but it's more around the content that sits within it. So I think one of the biggest things um, with the Hazard Co system is that you don't need to be an OHS professional. You don't need to have an OHS professional in the in the business at all because we give you everything that's legislated within the system. Then we break it down into stuff that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to identifying hazards, for example, most builders are going to know what hazards are on their job site because they do it every day. Mm -hmm. So they pick a hazard and then automatically it'll drop down with all the control measures that could or should be used in that particular um, within that particular hazard or risk. And then they just click on the ones that they will be using in that on that job site. So the language, um, you know, where we can, we will modify it to be the most simple possible explanation of what we're doing. There are certain instances where we can't because we obviously want the system to still be in compliance. So if someone's mm -hmm. checking it, they are they know what they're looking at. Yep. Um, but the formats very all, all very basic. So. Uh, when it comes to SWIMS, for example, don't know how often you guys have been looking at safe work method statements, but some of them can be like 28, 40 pages of just a lot of information that I'm pretty sure no one ever reads. And likelihood is they sign it because someone said you've got to sign it before you start the job, if you're lucky and they've even got one to begin with. Um, and it, it's, it's just I don't really understand what this means. So when we when we designed our swims, it's literally, you know, one table, four columns, and here, pick up your saw and do this and then do this and then do this. And that's exactly um, laid out in very simple terms. This is the risk involved with the work you're doing. This is the control you're going to use. And these are the steps you're going to take to perform the task. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden your 28 pages becomes four pages and it's, and it's much more um, easy to visually digest as well as really understand. And sometimes we get called out on it then um, it's like, oh, this looks too basic. Like how could this be, you know, a proper terms? And it's like, well, it still includes everything as far as legislation is concerned. It's just you're so used to seeing, you know, all these other templates that have, bazillion pages of stuff that no one's ever looked at what's you know what in your mind do you think is better four pages that actually get gets read and actioned or 28 pages that no one understands and is likely signed and just walked onto the job and done whatever they wanted anyway um, a great point, yeah. so, <laughs> so there's got to be there's got to be a balance like i said we obviously still make sure that everything um is in compliance and all those mandatory items sit within each document but really the whole point and the whole mantra of Hazard Co is making safety simple. Um, and to do that, it means making the language more understandable to the average Joe um, and making the documentation easy to read and easy to follow um, and easy to access. And I guess that's the whole, you know, 88% of Australians have a smartphone. So um, that made sense for us to have. It's kind of like uh, I, I sometimes talk about <clears throat> with our clients uh, the 10-year-old test when they're creating systems and documents and communication within their businesses of, of could your 10-year-old understand basically what needs to be done here? And it's, it sounds a little bit like that with the four pages versus the 28 pages. It's more likely to get used if it's simpler uh, and there's like the, an inverse relationship between the number of pages and the likelihood that the system is actually going to be used. So, you know, it's sort of, it passes the 10 year old test of uh, a level of understanding there. And I think we've just lost Vanessa. <laughs> Coxie, um, while we wait for Vanessa to come back. Uh, I've got a, a, an interesting question I'm ready to pose to Vanessa when she's able to join us again. I'm really intrigued. So something that we've been talking a lot about with our members of late has been the generational difference. Mm. And I can imagine that actually formulating this program, this app, this um, the whole safety experience must be really challenging to do so in a way that all the generations can understand. Because I know as a mum of a 17-year-old, a 19-year-old and a 20-year-old that are all working within or around the trades, 
their level of understanding is really different to my level of understanding after being in the industry for so many years and having to deal with the safety paperwork. Mm -hmm. I'm really keen to hear how Hazard Co have managed to ensure that their um, understanding is comprehensive enough that everybody can have the opportunity to get it, I suppose, Mm -hmm. quite simply. Mm. Right, Vanessa's back. We found her somewhere in the interwebs. Sorry. <laughs> it's not your fault. Have you got a swims for that when you go missing on a podcast? Internet connection issues. No, unfortunately cannot solve that problem. We're probably on just, our own. Probably just the raging here in the studio when it happens and the swearing <laughs> that goes on. <laughs> Which, you know, we're talking technology. So, yeah, so it's a good segue into what uh, Coxie and I were just sort of posing while you were floating around in the Ethernet thing. <laughs> in the um, Ether? About... Yep the the different generations um, that are working on the same sites and the use of technology around this. Is that something you guys have addressed? Yeah. So, look, um, you know, it, it's interesting the way that Coxie has um, sort of asked that question has you'd almost think that it would be harder for the younger guys to, to come on board, but it, it's probably the opposite. So for the, the newer guys, and it's not necessarily um, that they're young, it might be just that they're, they're new to building or new to, new to the industry. As with anything, the, um, you know, when you start with something, it's much easier to absorb than if you have been doing something, you know, one way for 30 years and then you try and change it. So, mm. yes, there is always going to be, um, you know, someone who takes that little bit longer to, you know, adopt the system or to change an attitude. Um, and, and that really, again, comes down to communication. And this is a conversation that we have with our builders all the time, mm. is that you cannot make these sort of changes and expect it to be, bang, a board goes up on the fence and all my problems are solved. Mm. It's unfortunately not that simple. Um, it does require you to still have conversations. So you still need to have the conversations. We're not taking away the conversations. We're just trying to make the conversations easier or provide topics for conversation. Um, so, look, in this day and age and definitely in the last 12 months with um, with COVID, you know, the whole scanning in and out of site is definitely not something that is too mm-hmm. tricky. Most people are quite used to it now um, and most of the app um, performs off the back of that scan. So really what comes um, what comes after that is the is the active safety management. So the, the ability to create a swims and submit a swims, the ability for a site supervisor to do a site review or hold a toolbox talk, um, for guys to check their vehicles and do maintenance checks. Um, and again, you know, like I said, 88% of Australians have a smartphone. So there's a very small percentage of them that that won't. Um, and generally, the builders will be aware of those, um, you know, those members that maybe have an older device, like a, a flip phone or, um, you know, Nokia 3110 and they're still playing Snake. <laughs> um, the, 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 ability, the ability then obviously is, you know, you, you either need to have a conversation around the technology or you pair them up with someone who has the technology. So mm-hmm. the, the likelihood is they're generally not working alone. They're within a team. Um, and it just means that they share the device of someone else um, to, to scan themselves in. Or, you know, worst case scenario, site supervisor can, can scan someone in. Mm. But what we're trying to do is obviously make it much more of an individual um, responsibility. So we don't want the site supervisor going around scanning everyone in. We want everyone to take responsibility for their own um, health and safety and know their own processes and scan themselves in. But we realise that these things happen. I mean, my husband's a sparky. I don't know how many phones have fallen off roofs. Um, <laughs> he sat on, um, my favourite was our apprentice when he sat on a really hot roof and had his phone in his back pocket and the phone bent. Um, so I had to take it back to Optus in a V-shape. Um, <laughs> there has definitely been a learning curve around technology and definitely insurance policies for, for trade-owned um, phones. Yes. But generally, uh, the, the, most of the population finds it very easy to do. Again, you know, it's a two-second process to scan the QR code and click a button and you're scanned in and you click another button and you're scanned out. Um, and when it comes to their active safety management, it's all, you know, click and drop box. So, again, they're not having to really think about um, what or how they should say things. We've provided that 
in there for them. It's literally just looking around the site and going, oh, yeah, that's there or that's not there. So I'm going to tick this box or I'm going to put across here and I'm going to take a photo as evidence and now I'm done and I can move on with the rest of my day. Mm. I wish I could time travel back to seven years ago with this <laughs> app and put it into my business. That place it's just so simple compared to the way it used to be done. Yeah, and look, it's always improving. Um, you know, that's the good thing about being digital. Back when we were a paper-based business, it was it was a long process to have to change or modify anything if it wasn't quite up to scratch. Mm-hmm. Digital, um, you know, you say, hmm, members don't like this. And within a couple of weeks, you know, you've got a new version of it um, mm-hmm. fixing that particular problem or trying to make that easier process. So we do work with um, our membership base and even even those who are just trialling our system um, as, a, as a free trial, we, we you know, always have a chat with those guys as well. So even if it's not the right fit for them, well, why isn't it the right fit for you? Give us some feedback because we'd love to learn how we can make it, you know, better and improve improve with time. So the idea is, is not just to have a static, you know, system. Oh, it, it fits the bill right now. The idea is how do we make it, you know, the best system for everyone, give them the most value out of, out of their health and safety um, and make it the easiest to roll out. So that that is something that we're definitely working on. So really good question, Foxy, because, um, you know, it can vary business to business, but we do have teams that help our members. So we do have a whole customer success team that basically, um, you know, trains and develops uh, both tradies and builders to implement the system into their own journeys and then tracks them along the way. So, um, you know, checks in on them and says, I can see you're still not doing toolbox talks, Jim. What's going on? Uh, Vanessa, I don't have time to do toolbox. Yes, you do. You do have time. You're going to make time. It's a quick conversation, a two-minute phone call, and then you're going to log it and then you're going to have it there and and it's all going to be okay. Okay. Um, So that's a big one, time. It's it's interesting you talk about toolbox talks, Vanessa, because it's a a multi-use tool. Uh, It's a multi-tool. It is a multi-tool. There's another pun. And uh, it's, but there's something that I'm blown away by how many business owners don't do Mm. weekly team meetings, uh, daily toolbox talks or team huddles or whatever you like. Uh, From our perspective, they're a a team morale tool, they're a training tool, they're a organizational tool, they're a way to make sure everyone's on the same page, that productivity's up. And if they're doing it for safety, then it almost becomes an easy thing to add on a couple of other agenda items each day and you've got everyone on board. Everyone knows what everyone else is doing. You've run through the jobs. You've told them how long they've got to do particular components of the work and you actually run a better business that way and the team enjoy their work more because they've got certainty and clarity about what they're doing so they're not frustrated or, you know, scrolling through Instagram behind the the portaloo because they don't know what they're supposed to do next and they don't want to go and ask. Uh, so to add safety into that or vice versa, it's like, yeah. you know, you got yourself your very own business Leatherman. Yeah, it's, um, and, and look, our, it, it is, it is obviously designed around safety, but then subheadings that sit within the toolbox talk, some of them aren't related to, you know, not, not fully to safety. So, mm. you know, one of the topics is upcoming work. Yeah. Upcoming work can be a lot of things. Mm. Um, another one is worker engagement, which is essentially just, what are the guys saying um, mm. once you've said whatever you have had to say? Mm. What's, if they're bringing issues up to you? So it's definitely, you know, Toolbox Talk is definitely a safety name, um, but it's not it's not necessarily just about safety. And it, it, it is really interesting because you look at all other industries and it's very not. I mean, it would be weird if you went into a corporate job and you weren't having a staff meeting. Like, yeah. what do you mean? How do you communicate? Who's who? How do I know what I'm doing? Yeah. You go onto a work site and apparently, no, it's, just show it's up. too hard to ask it. Show up, pick up some <laughs> tools and look busy. Yeah. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's a common conversation we have. And I think the main sort of um, blocker for a lot of builders holding toolbox talks is that they do work with 100% subcontracted workforce. So in their mind, they're like, well, I can't ask them to, you know, come away from their their businesses to talk about my business and it's like well but you're paying them so you are providing them work which means they should make time for you to mm-hmm. have a conversation but it doesn't need to be the traditional you know let's go to the job site at 6 a.m and have a barbie and 
you know, chin wag. Yes, some people don't have time for that. And lots of people are working in very remote areas that just mm. they don't have time to go back to a particular job site. But it can be as easy as picking up the phone and literally having a conversation, even if you have to have it one by one. So mm. even if you don't want to, you know, bring them all together and have one group conversation, well, that's okay. But you've still got to have a conversation. So pick up the phone and and have it and then record it. Um, and, and then you've got that as a piece of evidence that I did actually discuss that particular issue. Yeah. Even if it's not weekly, you know, starting with fortnightly or monthly um, is a good starting place. And then, you know, as you move forward, each business is structured different. So we understand that it's not always easy um, to do it the traditional way. And the other way is that the, the toolbox meeting actually generates a PDF report. Um, so you can email it as well. So even if you don't have a physical conversation you can still send out correspondence with regards to whatever it is that you want to talk about they're all date and time stamped as well so when you're looking at a project you can clearly see all the conversations um, that have been had between various different parties it's a really good way for even the guys who've got employed trades to use it like a mini site diary um, mm-hmm. this, this happened today tom did this and bob did that and tomorrow simon i need you to do this um simple Mm. It's all there. Everyone can see it. Vanessa, it sounds to me like we've just removed a whole bunch of excuses <laughs> for employers, business owners uh, to do the right thing, you know, to do what's best and best practice. And it's not just about safety. That's that's what I think is is um, an important yeah. point about it. It's It's about actually running a good business. And at the moment with – material shortages, the state of the labour market, um, the uncertainty about economic conditions for the next 12 to 24 months or maybe the next 30 years, who knows. Uh, it, it, it's more important now than ever to have good, tight business practices and safety as a system is a part of that, but it it has that multifaceted benefit of running a tighter team. And, you know, I think the whole I don't have time to do a toolbox meeting, that's a load of bullshit. It's that you're not making it a priority and I think business owners let themselves make too many BS excuses about why they're not doing things rather than just make it a priority, choose to do it and allow the benefits to actually come off the back of that rather than just convince themselves that it's a waste of time. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and um, you're in that camp, then – that's great because there are people like and businesses like Hazard Co, Vanessa and the team, uh, obviously here at Traders in Business, we support our clients to implement those changes. Uh, so that's what I love about what you guys are doing, Vanessa, is just there's no excuse. It's simple. Mm-hmm. It's affordable. Uh, it's well supported. You really have no reason not to do something like this and um, and stop making safety such a pain in the ass. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> What it does is it really encompasses everyone. So once you start sharing the load, once you start having those conversations, it makes people more accountable for their own actions and essentially makes them part of the conversation. And if you start listening to what they're saying from their perspective, I guess listening to their excuses, you can all come together and and come up with a common ground where, you know, maybe you both will save time um, if, Mm. if you're on the same page. Often, you know, it's a bit of a tit for tat battle um on my subbies won't do it um i don't have enough time whatever it might be and there's always this sort of ball flowing across the court as to as to whose responsibility or or whose job it should be why can't it be both why can't Mm. we just have a conversation and you know delegate and separate and unite and essentially get the job done quicker um you know and safely all right, Vanessa. So I reckon most of our listeners are probably sold at this point and they want to find out more about Hazard Co. Where do they go and do that? <laughs> they can go, they can email us at info at hazardco.com or they can go to www.hazardco.com.au or they can call our um, 1-800 number, which is 1-800-954. And I've forgotten the end of the month. <laughs> I, and I was literally. I was, I was really impressed. I was thinking, I oh, there's even a phone number. 
That is amazing. Nine five four seven zero two. I was doing so well too. Oh. <laughs> I think you nailed it. <laughs> Finished on a high. <laughs> Vanessa, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, thanks for rolling through the technology challenges with internet dropouts and Zoom stuff. Um, look, safety is not necessarily the most exciting topic, but then neither is bookkeeping and cash flow and all the other things that we do in our businesses. And Coxie and I were literally having a bit of a uh, conversation this morning um, in our, our content meeting this morning about uh, things are hard. Business is hard. Life's hard. Safety's hard. Kids are hard. You know, money's hard. Just accept the fact that there's work involved and it can be hard um, and it's going to be hard. And there's things that you can do to actually just get it done and get on with it and mm. stop moaning about things. So um, great to have you on the podcast. Uh, stoked as always that you guys support our tradies in business members um, and our community uh, through the Excellence Awards and obviously uh, through some more things that we'll be working on in the future as I get my words out. Um, <laughs> check it out, listeners, hazardco.com.au. Because uh, I noticed there's a .com and a .au. One's got a .com and one's it got a .com. It, it'll go. It'll go to if you just put hazardco.com, it'll send you to the AU page. It's because we exist in New Zealand and Australia, um, mm. so it'll, it'll work out where you're where you're um, entering your website in from and send you to the right address. In, either way, fancy. You really are the fancy. whole package, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> All right, listeners, no excuse. Go get it done, Vanessa. Thanks again, and have a fantastic Friday. Thank you so much, guys. Always a pleasure. You've been listening to the Tradies in Business podcast with Warwick Bidwell and Nicole Cox. Find out more about today's guest, tools for your trade business and other cool stuff at tradiesinbusiness.com.au.